let you over the week elapse before with the paper you hand in your paper, your credit will simply collapse. And uh, I have here, for those who need it, a timetable for the rest of the quarter. Hands up those of you who are already satisfied that you've got uh, that firmly under your arm. Most of you have got these papers? Yes. Who have them? Well, I'd advise you to collect them at the end of the hour, and I'd advise you to tell your friends. Um, was that Beethoven's fifth, my dear? Sounded to me like somebody's old soup, but still, wasn't an unpromising bit. Did they, did they, did they play a good piece? Hmm? Ah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the fact is that uh, we're now dealing with vast and protean personalities. And uh, we played you a bit of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which E.M. Forster once characterized as a tremendous noise. As it came upon my ears, it seemed to be more like Campbell's tin soup than a really tremendous noise. But when it's going full and proper, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony with that destiny knocking at the door theme. Ta -ta -da -da -dum, ta -da -da -dum, ta -da 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 Did you hear that part? Good. Well, that should vibrate you a little bit. And of course, what it really means is that at the end of the 18th century, you have these vast and grand and protean personalities. You all know what Beethoven looked like. If I were to frown and frown and frown and frown, you would get some idea. Uh, and he is a typical romantic personality. And I just simply want to point out to you one very simple thing which happens in music at the end of the 18th century. Not only do you get a much larger orchestra, but you begin to get people using all sorts of new instruments, including cannons, and you get a completely different approach to something which is fundamental in music. And that is the difference between quiet music and noisy music. If you think just for a moment, the difference between a harpsichord or a clavichord or a virginals or a guitar and a piano. A piano which is so curiously misnamed, isn't it? A piano is so much louder than a clavichord or a harpsichord. Well, of course, the original answer is that it was not a piano, it was a pianoforte. And what does a pianoforte mean? It means soft, loud. And what happens at the 18th century is that everything suddenly becomes soft, loud, with a good deal more loudness in it and a good deal less softness in it. That is to say, you get tremendous contrasts. And you get the contrast of the French Revolution. Bach talks about uh, the beautiful quality of the French monarchy. And then quite suddenly there is no French monarchy. You can't play uh, music for a guillotine on a harpsichord. Mm? You need a pianoforte. You need, in fact, the full massed might of the orchestra. Indeed, you need Beethoven's Ninth Symphony almost, where he masses a huge choir too. And quite suddenly, you have absolute hush. And I think it's interesting that it is in this period, is it not, after all, that the conductor begins to appear. And the conductor is particularly important because the conductor is a romantic figure who tends to interpret the music, but also to the, to the audience, but also has uh, control over that fundamental issue which comes into music of the difference in its weight, its sonority. And so you suddenly have wonderful crescendos and splendid fortissimi mm? and then smashing little diminuendos until it all trickles away and hard air a single word blah, 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 blah. Uh, so that you can see that uh, we can expect similar figures and in a way David is a somewhat similar figure to Beethoven and Goya is in many ways a yet more comparable figure in the scale of his creativity and also in the tremendous and tempestuous effect that he has upon uh, the visual arts. 
not of course always immediately. And also I think you could compare both David and Goya to uh, Beethoven in the fascination of their personalities. And of course you can actually compare Goya to Beethoven in one other more intimate respect. You will remember the great tragedy of Beethoven's life was that he went deaf long before he died. And of course it was also the tragedy of Goya's life that he went deaf long before he died. Notice too that uh, Goya and David are more or less exact contemporaries. Goya is born in 1746 and lives to the age of 82, thus dying in 1828. David, I think, is born in 1748 and dies in 1826. They are thus both of them about 10 years older than William Blake, and they are therefore thus about 20 years older than that other extraordinary personality, Napoleon Bonaparte. Because Bonaparte is born in 1769, actually the same year that the Duke of Wellington is born. And then you have to think of them being contemporaries with Beethoven. But let's have a look at the slides, because I want you first of all just to look at uh, David and uh, uh, and here is David's self-portrait, and I want you to, to look at how he can confront himself so immediately, so directly, and you see he sees himself as a very, very special, even as it unrolls, this detail, he sees himself as a very special and extraordinary creature. Actually, David, interestingly enough, had a different impediment from deafness. He had a slightly, so far as I can make out, a slightly hair lip. Certainly had some deformation of his upper lip, which made him into a tremendous stammerer. And you might all of you like to think about that is aspect of artists, their tendency to be compensating for some physical defect, their tendency to be set aside by some physical peculiarity. And with David, it was probably some kind of very, very annoying Im impediment which made him just the more passionate. And one of the things is so fascinating is that he already betokens that very kind, very romantic kind of personality. What do I mean by romantic personality? A sort of personality who, who stops at nothing in order to express his emotions. He flings himself on his bed, pulls his shirt off, and presses the rose to his bosom, which his true love has given him, and heaves a deep sigh and cries, Armida, Armida, woe. Hmm? Well, actually, there is a novel which does exactly this, which was written by the... Who is the, who is the other great personality of this epoch whom we've not mentioned? The great Johann Wolfgang Goethe. And in the 1770s, when <coughs> David was much younger than this, when David was a young man going to Rome, Goethe wrote his famous novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. And the plot of it is very simple. Werther had a love for Charlotte, such as words could never utter. Would you know when first he met her? She was cutting bread and butter. Charlotte was a married lady, and a moral man was Werther, and for all the wealth of Indies would do nothing for to hurt her. So he pined and paled and ogled, and his passion boiled and bubbled, till he blew his silly brains out, and no more was by it troubled. <laughs> Charlotte, when she saw his body born before her on a shutter, like a well-conducted person, went on cutting bread and butter. <laughs> now, Charlotte was an 18th century woman. Werther was a romantic young man. And there were men all over Europe, young men all over Europe, who shouting Charlotte or murmuring Werther in the 1770s blew their silly brains out in imitation of this novel. Now you begin to get some idea of the romantic the notion of the romantic personality, something a little bit larger and different from life, something where the emotions become enormously important. And, in fact, I think young Monsieur David, when he first got to Rome, and wasn't a tremendous success, uh, well, no, it was before he got to Rome. It was when he was competing for the Prix de Rome. I'm sorry, when he was competing for the Prix de Rome, more than once he failed. And, undoubtedly, on one occasion, he tried to blow his silly brains out because he wasn't satisfied. And fortunately for him, and fortunate for us, he didn't. Let's have a look at the next. A look, at, a look at another romantic personality. And you see how they, have, they hypnotize each other, e themselves, with their stare and their self-portrait. This is Johann uh, Heinrich Fusli, or Fuseli. Remember who did the nightmare. And here he looks at himself, and he looks at himself with such puzzlement and also such wonderful vanity. Hmm? 
I mean, he's saying to himself, my God, my dear sir, you're one of the most interesting people I've ever come across. Hmm? I, you are the most interesting person. You're the most strange, you're the most odd, you're the most extraordinary. And let's have a look at another. And you see David has exactly that look, a, a mixture of vengefulness, haughtiness, splendor, absolutely autonomous. And the notion of the autonomous personality in art, you see, because that is interesting because the autonomous personality becomes the original personality. The person who prizes originality more than anything else. In David, of course, originality is absolutely tied to one other thing, which is discipline. This is painted at the time of the French Revolution, we believe. Look at the way his hair is blown about by revolutionary fervor. And you know perfectly well that David would be absolutely superb on the steps of the, the foyer of Mandela uh, McHenry. Well, he would, my dear, he became, you see, a member of the Committee of Safety. He became deeply, deeply, deeply involved in politics. If you want to read a light book on, on the whole period, you might, which concentrates a good deal on David, you might read a book by Jack Lindsay, who is a, a very, very interesting writer, uh, one, of the, one of the comparatively few communist or communist sympathizing art historians. And he calls his book Death of a Hero, and a great deal is about David. There's a, a more thorough, more reliable, more recent book by a woman called Anita Bruckner, which I could also much recommend to you on J.L. David. There's another book by a chap called Schnappers, which I must admit I have not read. Uh, and we mustn't stay, but look at the way, the truculence with which he even holds a brush. Uh, and he is ready to reorganize the whole academic system of French painting. He's ready to make a clean administrative sweep. And he's an administrator as well as a painter. Let's have a look at the next. Another vision of Fusley, even stranger, more like some kind of wombat or beetle, uh, you see, but seen by a strange light, again brooding and mysterious and much older with these weird hands. And it's fascinating because both David and Fusley live within the style of neoclassicism. And in a sense, Neoclassic style is such an oddity because it clothes temperaments and ideas and events which are boiling over with passion and paling and pining and bubbling, but which are nonetheless described, you see, in this deadpan fashion uh, which goes back to a clear sense of ancient sculpture. And here is a much more liberated, I think, a much more extraordinary figure of Goya. And we have to remember one thing about Goya as distinct for Fusley and uh, David. Fusley and David both spent a decade in Rome. Uh, they spent the 1770s in Rome. Herculaneum, Pompeii, Paestum, Dilettante, uh, merchants in ancient marbles, and a long apprenticeship to antiquity. Goya goes to Rome, I think, for about a year, and he comes back despising antiquity. He comes back more Spanish than ever. Goya is not moved by neoclassicism. He's a contemporary of David and uh, Fusley, but Goya is moved by Velasquez and Rembrandt, and you can see the influence of Rembrandt uh, directly. Goya also says, you know, he has the three masters, Goya, Rembrandt, Velasquez, and nature not the ancient world. So that Goya has a different aesthetic background in some respects, and different aesthetic ideals, but also he belongs, you see, to a much more obscure part of Europe uh, in the 18th century, which is 18th century Spain. France is where the action is. England is also where the action is. Spain is such an improbable place for the greatest artist in Europe to be living. And yet I think we have to recognize that Goya has a sweep, has a range, has a grasp, has a curiosity which far exceeds that of Fusley or David or Blake and is only matched by a much younger contemporary, uh, J.M.W. Turner. Okay, so now are some of our dramatis personae. Now what happens? Well, we'll 
pursue the career of David for a moment. And it starts off, you see, as you might expect it, David is a young man in France in the 1760s. He comes from a family of craftsmen. He's got uncle, one of his, one of his, one of his near relatives is in fact Francois Boucher. Already he's trying to take up a more serious subject than Boucher. Do you remember Boucher did all those Marses and those Venuses and Diana taking a, a thorn out of her foot and, you know, Cupid's kissing and uh, so on and so forth? David is already interested in the very serious subject, which is the suicide of Seneca. And Seneca was a Roman philosopher who opened his veins into a nice vessel and committed suicide. But as you can see, this is hardly painted with the kind of seriousness that that kind of suicide really demands. Uh, I mean, uh, Seneca is wagging his legs about, and this girl, I mean, can you imagine, saying, oh, Seneca, well, I don't really like your blood, my dear. Uh, and the curtains are, are the most frivolous kind of curtains you can possibly imagine. And the whole arrangement is still deeply rococo, isn't it? Well, in the 1770s, all that changes. It changes throughout Europe partly because of the German art critic Winkelmann, partly because of his friend, uh, A.R. Mengs, the German painter, partly because of a whole group of Englishmen who paint in Rome, and partly, my dears, because of a fascinating young American called Benjamin West. And another of the contemporaries of David and Goya is Benjamin West. I can't remember. I think he dies in... I think he's born in 1738, and he dies in 1820. So he's a little older. He's a little older than Fusi, but of course he has to be a little bit older because he's got to get from America, hasn't he? I mean, you know, he's somehow, it takes about 10 years to get from America to Europe in that period. I don't mean in sailing time, my dear, but in mental time. And it's an extraordinary thing that he does go to Europe. Where do you think West goes in Europe? Where would he go? Well, he goes to London, very good, very intelligent, my dear. That's where the money is, well spoken. But where would he go artistically? Oh, you haven't been listening to what I've been saying here. Rome, Rome darlings. That's the, that's the center, you see. So he goes to Rome. And in Rome, he begins to do some really very fascinating things. Well, we're going to see them in conjunction with this. When, when David gets to Rome, he still is interested in Roman or ancient heroes, but look what's happened to the architecture. It has suddenly become much more severe. He's thrown away those curtains. The landscape in the background is like a poussin. The look at, just look at the difference in the draperies. The draperies are no longer under the spell of Ajax. They're under the spell of a quieter detergent. Mm, they aren't curling up and frisking and frolicking. They're sober and severe. And of course, this is old Belisarius asking for arms. And you actually begin to see, look, most crucial, the emergence of a long and simple single silhouette. That is the new language of neoclassicism. A language which is spoken increasingly by David, and here is David's great painting of 1784, showing you how he moves towards that primitive diction. A primitive diction in so many terms. First of all, you notice that instead of things going off uh, in a diagonal kind of way, the whole of the background is sealed off and is parallel with the picture plane. And you notice that measure has returned just in terms of the way the floor is organized. And in fact, of course, in that sense, my comparison last time with Mondrian is a correct one. And then you notice how primitive and simple the architecture is. These columns have absolutely no basis. They've hardly got a capital. And then you notice the repetition of the gesture. And then you notice how he uses the light to silhouette the gesture. Uh, and then you notice the continuous silhouette over here. And then you notice how, in fact, he clearly divides the picture into two parts. And it's very characteristic of David to divide a picture into two parts and show the masculine world and the feminine world. He is deeply interested in the difference between the masculine world of Here's some heroism. These Horatia, of course, all taking an oath, and Daddy Horatius grasping in the proper Roman style the actual blades of the swords he's about to dish them out, forces them to swear like absolute mad. The young boys, the young, what, what happens to the young children? You notice that the small one is absolutely horrified. He says, oh, mummy, ah! the, the older one, the older one is intrigued by this display of masculine 
vitality and strange oaths. He maybe is ready to join shortly his father's world. Mm. In the meantime, of course, there are, the, there are the men all crisp and firm and fierce, and there are all the women saying, oh, help, what is going on in this crazy masculine world? Uh, and they form a rather different kind of triangle. Uh, and they're swooning because, of course, their husbands are about to go off and immolate themselves. So it is a, it is a story about, it's a painting about <coughs> nobleness, steadfastness, and Republican virtue, because these are Republican Romans, and they're going to defend the Republic. And what is David talking about? He's talking about the seriousness of politics and the tremendous need for self-sacrifice in the cause of a noble state. All right, well, let's have a look at the next. I said that David went to Rome. Well, as I said, Fusli went to Rome. And you can see in this drawing of Fusli how that Roman feeling, you see, can overwhelm you. Because here's this great gigantic foot from the statue of Constantine, and here's a person weeping over the glories of departed Rome and in, thoroughly enwrapped in that Roman dream. And the artists of the 1760s and 1770s became re-enwrapped in a world of antique heroism. And of course, you know that's exactly what Washington uh, and Jefferson and Adams were also deeply wrapped up in. It's actually what the British Parliament was deeply wrapped up in at the same time. They thought that the American Revolution was a sort of reenactment of getting rid of the despotism of uh, the Tarquins. Hmm? And here is another Fusley, which you see, it's, these are no longer Romans, these are actually primitive Swiss heroes, I think. And they are also swearing a tremendous oath that they will not depart, that they are dedicated to the public good. And that notion of dedication to the public good at all costs, which goes, of course, with having not very much in the way on of clothes, very often. Uh, and you can see that Fuseli is that fascinating creature. So obviously, a person who uses neoclassical neo -classical style to clothe deeply romantic ideas. Uh, and that's true of a great many of these artists. And here you see just the same sort of time. We now see the detail. You also notice how beautifully uh, David and how laboriously David paints the details. Look at the veins. Look at the kneecaps. And then look at the absolute clarity of his design. No mystifying shadows, no faltering in the drawing, the most iron determination to get every detail as right as possible, including, you see, archaeological details like how you actually held the swords. This is fascinating because this, I think, is a bit earlier, certainly earlier than uh, uh, the Oath of the Horatii of David, and this is a painting by Benjamin West. And I think I may have already told you the story of Benjamin West when he gets to Rome hmm, and he's taken to see all the Romans say, ah, this is an absolutely lovely young man. Ah, just from America. How oh, oh, very nice. Hmm? Oh, you are so gifted. You must come and see all the great marbles of Rome. And so they go and uh, young Benjamin West from Philadelphia looks at all these marbles and then they say, ah, no, Signor Rivest. Hmm? Occidentale, Signore Occidentale, hmm? you must look at the Apollo Belvedere. And West looks at the Apollo Belvedere. <laughs> and they say, Ar, Ar, Signore, what do you think? And he says, why, he's just like a Mohican brave. He's like the last of the Mohicans. And you see, West immediately associates American Indians with the primitive world of antiquity. And feels, of course, then immensely at home in this primitive world, and then himself paints a number of strictly 
neoclassical paintings. There you are. Look at all the verticals. Look at the horizontals. Look at the capital you support. Look at all the people who are actually parallel. The whole, the whole, the whole uh, composition is organized parallel to the picture plane. And the gestures are very, very clear. You're beginning to get that insistence upon silhouette. You've got uh, exactly the same kind of little children, but of course the West is enormously namby-pamby, isn't it, compared with the David. The David is immensely serious, and the West has a sort of slight simper. Well, I want to take one more moment in considering uh, West. Here's a detail, and you can see, look at the Christmas, and look at the extraordinary sculptural quality of this arm. The way the light plays across it, the regularity you notice that David here hardly shows you a quarter of a brush stroke. He wishes to have absolutely perfect and still surfaces. Mm? Nothing shall get in the way of his adumbration of the scene. Uh, and let's have a look at the next. I want to talk just a teeny bit more about Benjamin West, because West is faced, like David, with that issue of do we paint uh, about contemporary issues in historic terms or in current terms. And West actually made his name with a very famous painting which you're looking at here. Does that, do any of you know the subject matter of it? It's the Battle of the Heights of Abraham or it's the death of General Wolfe. You remember James Wolfe hmm, led that intrepid group of Englishmen up the St. Lawrence and then he found a renegade Canadian, a coureur de bois, who was telling the way up the heights of Abraham, and so all those soldiers clambered up, and then with their Indian allies, uh, the Britishers gave the French a terrible trouncing, but during the course of it, tragedy of tragedies, General Wolfe died. And here he is being painted. And here you see Benjamin West doesn't bother with a hero from the ancient world. He takes a contemporary hero. But you notice one very interesting thing. The use of a nude to dignify and, and ennoble the contemporary event. And he uses his splendid Indian right in the foreground, in a classical pose, you see. And that is the most clearly silhouetted in the whole of the painting. And it acts, you see, as a way of associating the present with the eternal. And in this respect, it is probably the most original painting of the late 1760s. And it's interesting, you see, that it is painted by an American. Fascinatingly, the Americans, when they come to England, tend to want to paint contemporary scenes. And here is, of course, Benjamin West uh, painting another contemporary scene. What is this? Who is this? Well, it's Benjamin Franklin. It's a signing of the peace treaty. Uh, what is this? It's William Penn signing a treaty with the natives. And so you can see that uh, Benjamin West became rather a dab hand at paintings of treaties. And this is, of course, a historic one. And again, you have this wonderful possibility of introducing news. Uh, and West really likes it. West eventually paints scenes from every possible epoch of history. He paints scenes from medieval history, he paints scenes from ancient history, he paints scenes from contemporary history. But it's very characteristic that there's a group of Americans who become deeply fascinated by overthrowing mm, uh, certain aspects of neoclassicism and painting contemporary events. Whereas David, having had a tremendous success with the oath of the Horatii in 1784, goes on now notice, he's getting closer and closer and closer to the French Revolution. It is now 1787 when he does his death of Socrates. Again, notice the characteristic, hmm? the clarity of the gestures, uh, the careful planning of each figure, the use of the foreground floor, again to set out these horizontals, the closing off of the composition so that you don't have interference from just any old thing, the severity of the architecture, the severity of the costume, and the severity of the emotions. The emotional severity equals the physical severity. And uh, this tragic figure lost in the deepest gloom, Xantippe running away, another young disciple clutching the wall in his despair, and this dear young fellow simply can't bear even to look at the hemlock, and then another great group over here, rather crowded, actually. And if you, if you want to think about it, that 
Socrates is bed is fairly well towards the middle of the room. Otherwise, there's no room for this small group over here. And I think this is a moment where David's genius slightly slips. It is fascinating that once again we can make, let's have a look at the next. We can make a, we can make a comparison between David and Canova. Because about four years later than David did the death of Socrates, Canova did a series of reliefs of the trial and the death of Socrates. And you notice that Canova uses very, very similar methods in some ways. Powerful silhouettes, lines, planes, parallel with the picture surface, closing off no deep space. And then an upstanding gesture, Socrates on trial. And again, the love of the classical helmet and the classical costume and the sandals and so on. Here's another, and I think much more beautiful moment, when Socrates tells his family to go and uh, the hooded, cowled women move off and you get a sense of just one high prison window. And actually in 1792, 1793, it is the very moment so fascinating. It's the very moment when the Earl of Elgin is looking at the frieze of the Parthenon. And Canova does this series, which is astonishingly like the frieze of the Parthenon. You notice the clarity, one, two, three, the intervals so clearly stated, the way in which pieces are divided by the simplicity of architecture. Let me show you just one more Canova. Absolutely beautiful things. Quite extraordinary. Quite extraordinarily lovely. Many of them are at a place called Posignano, which is where Canova was born. Those of you who have some real taste and want to read a book about uh, Canova, there's a marvelous book by a man called Fred Licht, L-I-C-H-T, which has the most beautiful photos from which these slides are made, actually. And there, Socrates dead. Again, one window, a little teeny niche, just to take up that bare place, which actually looks really like a giotto. One of the things that is interesting is that David and Canova obviously began to look not only at the world of classical antiquity, but they also, we know, began to look at the very primitive elements in early Italian painting. Uh, Giotto and the other artists of the Trecento of the 14th century. And again, look at the simplicity of the bed, making uh, a fierce and formidable rectangle and then the marvelous gesture of uh, Socrates' eyes being closed. Isn't that beautifully done? And look at the sobriety again of the drapery. All that Rococo world of flurry and fur below has totally disappeared. There's a mood of intense, concentrated emotion. A capacity to focus on essentials. And that may well have been partly simply as a result of the whole French Revolution. You know, Dr. Johnson once said, nothing so concentrates the mind uh, as the imminent prospect of death. And I think the French Revolution, like all great historical events, concentrates the minds of people. And they do things which they would never have dreamt of doing in any other circumstance. Just as you know, uh, in a battle, you can fight on when you've had both your hands chopped off. You may not even notice it until the battle is over. Well, a great historical event takes you entirely out of yourself. It takes artists out of themselves and enables them to concentrate with astonishing firmness. And I think this happened to Canova, and it certainly happened to David in what is perhaps the most famous of all his paintings. Brutus with the lictors bringing his dead sons. And you all remember the story. Again, it's a story which is so apposite to 1789. You remember that Rome had six kings, hmm? six Etruscan kings, and then the last one, Tarquin the Proud, hmm? was kicked out. And they set up the system, the republican system of the two consuls. Well, Brutus was one of the first two consuls. And something really appalling happened, as you recall, or at least any, this is how Livy the Roman historian tells us. And that was that Brutus's two sons, whether bribed by beauty or bribed by gold, I cannot recall. But bribed, decided to betray the Republic and to plot with Tarquin against 
the newly erected and noble republic. And this was discovered. And uh, the orderlies came to Brutus for their order. What were they to do with Brutus's two sons who had betrayed the, the republic? And Brutus was in his garden, walking up and down. And he continued silently walking up and down. And then, quite suddenly, he used his cane just to swatch away the head of a couple of flowers. And those messengers knew what the message was. And very shortly, his two sons were judicially killed. And the scene here is when Brutus realizes what he has done, and how he sacrificed his family to his country because the dead bodies of his sons, his traitorous sons, are brought before him. And it is a fascinating and rich painting. One of the things you notice immediately, of course, is that there's again this extraordinary separation of a masculine world and a feminine world, a world of action, even if it is frozen, and a world of grief. You also notice in this one that the whole centre of uh, the painting is empty. You then notice Brutus himself in this extraordinary prose with one foot over another, and actually David took the trouble to get hold of ancient marbles which copied, uh, which, which showed your portrait of Brutus. There's an excellent book just on this one painting by a man called uh, R.L. Herbert. Behind Brutus is this funny concoction which you see in silhouette. What is that? You remember that in every Roman house you had the household gods, the lares and panates. And so they're just to jam home what Brutus has done are his household gods. And he's had to sacrifice his household gods to the needs of the state. And then behind, in a sudden flash of light, and indeed you see light floods across the thing while he, poor man, is left in the most terrible darkness of his own conflict and terrible act illuminates the dead legs of his sons in this slow funeral procession. And then the light falls upon a Roman chair, which is specially designed by a, a contemporary Jacob, I think, a contemporary French furniture designer based upon models from Pompeii, do you see? So that he would get, David would get that detail right. And then we have a, a grandmother turning away in absolute horror. She may be... Uh, a slave, and then we have the wives, uh, the wives and children uh, of the dead traitor exclaiming in horror with the children, of course, traumatized by the thought of the dead body. And most fascinating and significant and in a way terrible and poignant and something which tells you that in his own way David is an extraordinary dramatist one of the great imaginers of all time, on the table is the still life of family affection and daily care, the still life of darning, of clothes mending, of attending to the underwear of daily life, which is now abandoned under the shrieking outstretched hand while the father of the family looks on in his terrible conflict, and burns inwardly with a mixture of shame and pride against this iron background of remorseless logic and of remorseless architecture, heavy, cumbersome, defeating, tremendous, and imprisoning. And you see, for many, many years, David was said to be a dull painter and nothing of a colorist. And yet, in fact, the blood-red tablecloth, the rich gold on the simple floor, the actual color of the floor is most beautifully painted. The sobriety of the costume, and yet the sense of flush, and yet paling people here. As all the life goes out of them, 
as all the warmth is suddenly chilled by this marmorial procession when you realize that David is a great colorist as well as a great dramatist and the most marvelous draftsman. If you actually watch the beauty uh, of the lines over here hmm, and the intricacy and yet controlled intricacy, intricacy of these two children and their variegated poses and the way in which he manages to get an absolutely perfect profile without your feeling that this is hopelessly stagey. And then the mystery of the shadows cast upon this upstanding and menacing column. And of course, behind David is such a long tradition of French painting, including Poussin and also including Chardin. And Chardin, the still life painter, Mm. And his little work in still life is then ennobled and dignified by a still life right at the center of, uh, there's another little shard now, of the os, of the, of the, I mean, of the uh, 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 Brutus. Well, the Brutus is 1789, but what also is happening in 1789? The uh, Estates General are meeting. Mm? And the Estates General are saying, well, we will, not, we will not disperse until we have given France a new start. And you remember they actually go to the tennis court. Mm? They're kicked out of their normal assembly meeting, the Tiers Etats, the third estate goes to tennis court, and they take a tremendous oath, we will not disband. So that what David, I mean, can you imagine what it must have been for him? He had four or five years previously, on the basis of a play by Corneille, the Horatii had done this famous painting which I showed you, the Oath of Horatii. And then five years later, what happens? But that kind of oath is reenacted in real life. So that David has this appalling thing of realizing that he's in some sense prophetic. And that is not an easy thing to be. Because most prophets turn out to be Cassandras. And, as you know, Cassandra is a prophet of doom. But, of course, when it happens, when the real thing happens, David becomes enormously excited. And the whole of the French state, you see, gets involved in a, a quite extraordinary thing. I told you the, 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 the thing that should strike your imagination immediately, which is the attempt to have a new calendar, to start off again in the year one. Just imagine if we were to start the year one in 1985. I'm afraid the most likely form of the year one starting in 1985 is a rather glum one, isn't it? <laughs> but think, on the other hand, it might be that we had, to, we had to start a new epoch in the year one, formerly 1985, because of, at long last, some sense of those stupid superpowers coming down off their perfectly perfidious pinnacles and behaving like ordinary people. <laughs> but, whether, whether, that, whether, whether, whether that happens or not, you have to, you have to think, I mean, what, what would we do if that happened? I mean, we would rejoice and surely we'd throw these ugly buildings away <laughs> immediately. I mean, you know, because we know that we could afford to have things infinitely more beautiful and quite, quite different, and that we would not worship a mathematico, computero, technological world. We should worship a different world. And that is, you see, what happens with the French Revolution. So it means for a dedicated artist, a dedicated revolutionary artist, what, what, what happens? Well, they fling all the buried French kings out of their tombs. They knock down, they knock down Gothic cathedrals. They break stained glass. They ruin tombs. And they set up new altars. They set up new temples. And David becomes involved in something which is absolutely fascinating. He, there is, there is a book by a man called O'Dowd, which is called J.L. David, Pageant Masters of the French Revolution. And what David does is to organize processions and celebrations and pageants and festivals. Uh, you know, with a float to the goddess reason, with a float to virtue, with a float to heroes. Um, I mean, a sort of gigantic, what is that thing down in Los Angeles, a great... The, the great, I mean, you know, it's not a rose parade, it's a, it's a, it's a prickly thorn parade, it's, it's a revolutionary parade. And he, he, he organizes them for more than one year, and then he organizes what is to go on the altars. And the altars have to change. You can't have a cross any longer, you can't have a crucified Christ. There has to be a new deity. And finally, the new deity, which is set upon really by Robespierre, but with the help 
of David is the goddess reason. And it is fascinating to see that that new epoch, that new epoch decided to worship a goddess rather than a god. And David can no longer, you see, once, once the tennis call oath happens, he can no longer go on painting Brutus or, or Cassius or Caesar or that kind of person. He is now swept up in the contemporary world and he's swept up in just the way that this extraordinary curtain blows into the great tennis court and occupies this upper, this upper space. And you see this wonderful shadow. And here is the great painting, or at least the cartoon of the great painting, which David never managed to complete, of the tennis court oath. And you can then begin to see that actually, of course, it is much more difficult to paint contemporary events than to paint events which happened 2,500 years ago, like the death of Socrates. Because if you paint the death of Socrates, heavens, we know so little. So you can decide what Socrates looks like. But if you've got to paint, if you're going to paint a contemporary event, you have to know what uh, 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 C.A. or what Talleyrand or what uh, uh, Mirabeau uh, or what hundreds and hundreds of these deputies actually look like. So poor old David had to do an enormous amount of straightforward portrayal. Uh, and then you think, the fact is, of course, if you take this ancient thing, you can limit the number of, you can limit number of characters in the action. But everybody knew how many members of the third estate were actually in that room. And so I don't suppose any critic actually said, 343, 344, David, where is the 723rd deputy? But nevertheless, you've got a mise-en-scene, everybody knows about him, so you've got to make it convincing. Nevertheless, look at these gestures. And you see these gestures at once look forward, of course, to something we're very frightened of, all that Zieg Heilery, but also look backward to the classical gestures of antiquity. And human beings were going to make new gestures in a revolutionary epoch. Hmm? And they're all saying, yes, I swear. And, of course, actually, that is the origin of all that Zieg Heiling. It's, a, it's, a, it's an oath-taking effect. And here we have a wonderful, touching thing, because one very, very, very ancient deputy who is being carried in on a wheelchair, or, you see, is being sworn in. Now, the organizing of this kind of uh, picture is very difficult. Uh, David was not organizing in a vacuum. And again, it's very interesting. Just as Benjamin West starts painting some of these neoclassical paintings before David, and also paints the famous Death of Wolf. So another absolutely fascinating American artist comes to Europe and goes steadily downhill in many ways, but paints scenes from contemporary life. And his name is John Singleton Copley. Uh, and J.S. Copley was a young man in the 1760s again. He followed West to England. He corresponded with West. While he remained in America, he was largely taken up with portraiture. He arrives in England just at the right moment, just before the Revolutionary War breaks out. And he becomes English, 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 but liberal English, if you like. And here he is painting in the 1780s a very famous contemporary scene, and a scene which is closely related, you see, to the David scene. What is happening here? Well, somebody is expiring. And this is the great William Pitt, who had sent Wolfe off to fight the battle of the Heights of Abraham, and who became the Earl of Chatham, suffered terribly from gout, and there's the very same gout stick that we saw being used by Hogarth in Mariage à la Mode, and the scene is taking place in the House of Lords. And the, the Earl of Chatham went down to the House of Lords and he delivered a five-hour speech hmm, while expiring. Uh -huh. And uh, his speech was a speech which was an attempt to conciliate the two quarreling sides in the American Revolutionary War. So who could be more suited to paint it than a young American who'd come to England. And you see Copley actually struggling with very similar kind of problems and the difficulty of animating the upper part of this large room, the difficulty of doing justice to the house, the, 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 Marqu the noble dukes and marquises and earls and viscounts over here, and the great advantage he has because 
uh, the Earl of Chatham is bowled over, and uh, then the use of the stripes in these peers' robes, and I'm not sure that the peers actually appeared in their robes, but it was helpful and gives the whole thing a nice bloody quality, doesn't it? And then you notice these two peers, it's not really quite clear what they're doing. Hmm? Uh, have they got up on a ladder? Uh, why are they jumping about like that? But it shows you the organization uh, of a group, a large group portrait. Well, David's group portrait of the uh, Tennis Court Oath is just about the largest group portrait you could possibly imagine. And here we see some preliminary studies of a group, an important group within the whole thing. And you notice, very fascinatingly, that because of his training, he still thinks so much in neoclassic terms, even when he's doing a contemporary event. And in preparation, he, like many another painter, uh, actually takes all the clothes off, and then all these men have really rather similar bodies, except for this chap, who has, really has a bit of a tummy. Hmm? And then you see the brilliance of their gestures, and then you see these perfectly charming portraits uh, slopped onto them. Uh, and you can see then what a tremendous effort the great tennis court oath was going to be if it had come off. But there wasn't time. Hmm? David was swept ineluctably onwards and onwards. Let's have the next towards further events. Uh, some idea of his quality in that tennis court oath is gained by comparing him to the Copley death of the Earl of Chatton, but equally, I think, by comparing him to another American painting, this time by John Trumbull. Uh, John Trumbull was even younger and probably just missed a, a bullet in the Revolutionary War. His father uh, was a prominent person. He, he took, I think he took some part in the combat. And then in the 1780s, he came to England and decided to become the great chronicler of the Revolutionary Wars. And there is a whole book, it's a small book, a short book, by a woman called Irma Jaffe on this one picture. And I must admit, it's a rather thin book because the substance is hardly there. And you can see dear old, dear old Trumbull, he's done his best so that you can pick out Washington and uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin and one or two others, but it's a pretty dull and undramatic painting. And you'd have thought that signing the Declaration of Independence deserved some nudities, perhaps or it deserves some people standing on ladders, or it deserves some gestures. Hmm? And all it really gets is a few hands on hips and people sort of shifting uneasily from buttock to buttock. Uh, and a very sketchily painted trophy at the back. But nonetheless, there it is, and I throw it in so that you think about it. Well, in the, from 1789 to 1790 to 1793, David paints like somebody possessed. And you see that in his portraits. Here's a portrait of the period, and I want you just to look, because he's such an exciting painter when he is excited. You know, at the height of his powers, you just watch the quality of the paint just in the background, or the paint in the hair. And then you look at this poor Madame Trudin, and what has she seen? She's seen something on the guillotine. And then you look at the extraordinarily simple silhouette, the absolute economy of color, and yet the immense presentment of a scared, frightened, and astonishing human personality. And there are several portraits in this period which have something of this absolute vividness and immediacy. And then, quite suddenly, of course, we come to his David's central image. And I think it, it's worth asking and a very interesting question, which is that if you are carried onward and upwards by a historical event, and you reach a kind of apogee, and you paint something which is quite extraordinary. What is the aftermath going to be like? Can you ever recover? Can you go back to daily life in an ordinary way? What is your language going to be when it's all over? Because, of course, in 1793, 1794, it was all over. And the great Robespierre, the sea green incorruptible in the phrase of Carlyle, totters and is himself executed. You get the directorate, and the directorate is the, is the running of France by a whole series of fops and mm, currency manipulators uh, and realtors and second-hand car, car, car salesmen 
I mean, you know, a real wonderful riff raffery of people who've done awfully well out of uh, debased uh, assignats, who've done awfully well out of seized uh, monastic properties, and who no longer have the revolutionary impasse. What will Davi do then? But that's not yet. Now he's at the height of his power, he's at the height of his, height of his public importance, and he's at the height of the revolutionary fervor and excess. The days of 92, when the prisons are opened and all the prisoners are taken out and killed, Mm, and 1793, when the royal family is assassinated, there's a wonderful drawing by David of Marie Antoinette on her way to execution. False teeth out, chin dropped, mob cap on head, a grizzly, scared, and tragic old woman. And then one of David's own heroes, Marat, the doctor publicist, who has been, who's known as the Ami des hommes, the, the friends of everybody, the friend of everybody, and who is one of the great revolutionary leaders, orators, and journalists, is assassinated. Assassinated by Charlotte Corday. Charlotte Corday comes and pretends that she's going to present a petition and gets past, you know, the antechamber where everybody's writing things and, you know, there are lots of beds and old banana skins and God knows what, and penetrates to where poor old Mara is in a, a, a bath because he's got a horrible skin disease and he has, to, he has to wear all sorts of nasty flannels all the time. And uh, she presents her petition and then she steps forward, one little sharp stab and a knife on the ground, and a little splash of blood, and Marat is dead as a doornail. And this is painted immediately. There's a drawing which is even more immediate, and this is probably used, you see, in, we know that the drawing was used, and this is also probably used in one of those festivals, in one of those processions. Hmm? On a great tumbril, hmm? there is the portrait of the great hero, Mara, assassinated. Now, you notice what an extraordinary picture it is, with the whole of the upper half, this is a very bad slide, by the way, whole of the upper half absolutely dead, void, empty. Another world, or a final emptiness. And you see it is really very, very interesting. The crown of thorns is now just the turban of uh, flannel for his illness. And there's no doubt about it that, uh, could we go on and have a look at the next, that David, immediately seizes upon the whole notion of the Pieta, and possibly the most famous Pieta ever, Michelangelo's Pieta, and there is Marat's arm. Go, go back, would you please? There is Marat's arm, do you see? And then you notice other things, the absolute, how close are you to Marat? Well, not any distance. David insists upon your feelings immediately, and he does it by establishing right in the front plane, doesn't he? Absolutely in the front plane of the painting is this piece of very simple, very simple wood. And what is that also telling you? Of course, it's telling you that Marat is a man of the people. No gilded bonheur du jour desk for him, but just an old packing case. And the light touches the packing case and uh, reveals its every little imperfection. Mm? And the insistence upon the nails, you notice Actually, David, with a kind of obsessive splendor, reveals that one of the nails is missing. And what that does is to say, concentrate, concentrate, get, look at this with those absolute absence of any kind of eyelid, and see it with your whole being, and see every teeny detail of it. He does another thing which is very interesting. In 17th century painting, still life, you very often have uh, a little piece of paper or a little piece of fruit, or a little handle, or a bit of orange peel, which breaks out from the space of the picture. Remember that the picture goes back away from you, protrudes into your space. And here, Davi, uh, Mara, busily writing, dealing with affairs of state for the Committee of Public Safety, instructing the people of France. And one of his instructions just peeps over the edge uh, and then his own body. Notice again the careful way in which the tired hand, the caloused elements of it, uh, is painted. Uh, to go with this, the 
pen drops out of his hand, the knife falls to the floor, and all the lines are downward lines, lines of slowly freezing death, and a strange beauty on the very plain face, and the sense of immortality conveyed partly by the fact that this does duty also as a tombstone as well as a desk, and the, the simplicity of the inkwell is marvelous. And the simple inscription, not to the great Mara, not to the noble Mara, not even to citizen Mara, but just a Mara. Enough! Hmm? Because this revolutionary hero can never be forgotten. And all is illuminated by all seeing light, by the splendor of beautifully painted, clear, simple, gentle, soothing, revealing, time divine, and yet time telling light. And Mara will fall cold. And David will fall. David, come on. David, on. David. David will fall from favor. And with the death of Robespierre, the end of Robespierre, David is himself in danger of life, and he goes into prison. Now, can you imagine what it's like to go into prison after being right at the center of this, not to know from day to day? And he paints a portrait of himself in prison, and then he paints this, his only landscape. Hmm? Some kind of connection with some kind of daily life. And he has to repair his life right in the middle. And his life has as much of a fissure as Goya's life has. In the almost immediate same year, Goya has this terrible illness which leaves his whole physique shaken and himself totally deaf, deaf, deaf. And for Goya, his deafness seems to unleash a new world of artistic exploration. For David, in spite of this beautiful landscape, in spite of many triumphs of a second-rate kind to come, his fall in 1793-1794 and his imprisonment really leads to a series of appalling brilliant disappointments, and dead end after dead end after dead end. It's as though all his sincerity and all his seriousness are somehow pulled out of him. Uh, the landscape, which is an exquisite small painting, is of course from daily life. But what happens afterwards? David, from being a revolutionary, becomes an adherent of Napoleon Bonaparte. And he then paints, amongst other things, this splendid, but in some ways empty, vision of Napoleon crossing the Alps for the great first Italian campaign. And the horse is a Greek horse. The Alps themselves are sadly unlike any real Alp. And Bonaparte is a quintessential hero the private with a marshal's baton, well, he's a long way towards the marshal's baton, and, of course, with the most utter arrogance, Bonaparte, Hannibal, Charles the Great. And you notice the extraordinary importance of the silhouette, you notice the stage equality of the horse's mane and tail, you notice the up-pointing gesture, which probably comes ultimately from Leonardo and John the Baptist, Ah, uh, and then you notice the unbelievably beautiful Napoleon. Well, Napoleon clearly, as a young man, was very beautiful. It's also, I think, quite clear that there are human beings who are disturbing in this kind of way. And they're not always beautiful, but they have, a, they have a capacity to disturb ordinary souls and to subjugate ordinary people. I mean, Hitler obviously had something of that. Uh, and Napoleon obviously had something of that. And it can happen, and young, young people can have it, and old people can have it. Uh, and uh, David falls into this world, a world which, in my view, is much, much less interesting. That's wonderfully good painting. It is fascinating to make a direct comparison from David to Goya. Because this is Goya painting the Duke of Wellington. And... Uh, here is the Duke of Wellington, in some ways looking like a slightly mystified English country gentleman. 
on a rather inadequate, on a rather inadequate steed, and absolutely exhausted and very reproachful. And uh, next time I'll show you Goya's drawing of the Duke of Wellington. But Goya sees the Duke of Wellington having looked into the face of death. David sees Napoleon as some kind, I think, of uh, porcelain, uh, antique, and yet modern superstar. Thank you. <laughs>